turn into your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of John, chapter 6, John chapter number 6. Thank you, Lord. John chapter number 6, and when you get it, I'm going to ask you if you would stand in honor and reverence to the Word of God this morning. May the Lord bless the preaching of the Word today. We find our text starting in verse number 66. I'm going to read through verse number 69 today. John 6, starting in verse 66, John writes, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, speak to us today through your word. Let the Holy Ghost work on the hearts of us as believers and Draw today by the preaching of the gospel the heart of a sinner listening and watching right now. That judgment wouldn't catch them, that mercy would pick them up and grace would save them today. Lord, as we lift you up, draw all men unto you today. Pray a blessing over each and every person that hears the word today. I ask all of it in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. A.W. Tozer made a statement. He said that the sovereign God wants to be loved for himself and honored for himself. That is only part of what he wants. The other part is that he wants us to know that when we have him, we have everything. We have all the rest. Now the writer C.S. Lewis said, He who has God and everything else has no more than he who has God only. By the help of the Holy Ghost today, that's where I want to draw our thoughts to. That the Lord Jesus is enough, but that he's not just enough, he is more than enough. And a question would present itself to us today based on the context of the story and the scriptures that we're reading today. Asking a question. Should I stay or should I go? I remember a day when the Apostle Paul was looking out and he was thinking about life and he thought about all the problems that an individual could have and then he thought a little more of all the troubles that humankind would face and all the burdens that they had to carry. And he says in his letter to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 15, he says, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? There's an answer to Paul's question in verse 16 where he asks, And who is sufficient for these things? In our lifetime, 
in the even, even in the lifetimes that preceded us up until today, there is no human being, even though they may seem great in and of themselves, that can meet every need in your life and in my life. But let me give you a word of hope and encouragement today, something of comfort that is one who still can do all that you'll ever need, give you all that you'll ever need. His name is Jesus Christ. If you're saved today, you know him as Lord and Savior. But to those that are listening and don't know who he is that are not saved, he is the begotten of the Father. He is the Son of the living God. He is the adequate, all-sufficient Savior of the world. He meets every need in your life and in mine. And in Him and with His help, we can face life and all that it may throw in our direction. As we look at our text in the 6th chapter of John's Gospel, the story kind of picks up there at the end of the chapter right after Jesus had fed the 5,000. And he proves to the multitude then, and of course to the reader if you're reading the story, that he can meet the physical need of man. They were hungry. They were in need. They had no food. And some of the disciples were worried. They, were, they know they don't have enough money. They're questioning and, and the Lord, what are we going to do? There's men and women and children, and they're all hungry. Jesus, the Bible, if you'll read the story earlier in the chapter, it says Jesus already knew what he was going to do. I can promise you, whatever situation you'll ever face, whatever need you'll ever have, whatever circumstance you'll already go through, Jesus already knows what he's going to do for you. You just need to trust him. And so the crowds had gathered around him, and many actually cared nothing for Jesus, the person. As we have read these few verses in our text, we can see that. And, but he just wanted, or they just wanted what he had provided for them. And that seems like a consistent thread in our day. People want his hand, but they never want to seek his face. They weren't then and still are interested really in him today as Savior. They simply wanted to be fed physically. They wanted something for nothing. It's really no different today. And the sad fact is this. You can't get people in the house of God uh, in this hour that we're living in anymore unless you've got some fried chicken and some banana pudding waiting on them after the preacher closes the service out. There's no desire to come together with God's people anymore and, and praise and worship and thank the one who gave us everything to keep our sinful soul out of a fiery hell. It's such a sad day that we're living in and the great falling away that's taking a, a place around us that people don't have a passion for the things of God anymore. So here's the Lord. He's preaching a sermon, a sermon to which he makes a plea for them to surrender their lives, a sermon in which he demanded that they give instead of receiving. Well, now, preacher, you're, you're kind of already drawing a, a thin, fine line this morning. That doesn't sound like the better end of the deal. We have to give of ourselves and receive Nothing. Well, on the contrary, we have received everything we'll ever need. But little did they know here in this hillside uh, how much his father was about to give them on a hill called Calvary. Many times when I think about what Jesus did for me on an old rugged cross, I feel like I got the better end of the deal and he got the worst end. But here's the point, and I, I won't be long this morning. They were willing to follow him as long as he was feeding them and requiring nothing of them. But when he begins to tell them what would be expected of them if they continued to follow him, 
That great crowd turned away from him and went back to the world, back to their way of living. Initially, they counted the cost. They, 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 they weighed in the balance, you could say. And when they compared the flesh and the spirit, and they decided that it cost them too much. Why? Because their carnal appetites were just too important to them to spend with him. May I make a statement to someone listening this morning and then ask you a question. The life that you get to live is a very valuable thing. James tells us that it's like a vapor. You're here for a moment and then the moment is gone. Paul states in 1 Corinthians 3.23, And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10.23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And so then we come to the question. And understanding that we have free will choices because of the love of God from the beginning... But our present day decisions have eternal consequences. And so I would say to you this morning that life is an expensive commodity. What are you spending it on? Many today are like these people in our text in John here. Let a man preach the free grace of God. Let, let him talk about all that man can receive and get for themselves as a Christian. Let him tell of the, if I may, modern day pie in the sky by and by. And they'll stop when he's done and say, boy, he is a preacher, isn't he? But let him preach a sermon like this today about how the Lord Jesus is still calling men and women to forsake the world. And to follow him. Let him ask for dedication in the church for the work of the Lord. Let him call for them to go out to the world and share this glory of gospel. And the majority will turn their backs on it. See this large crowd that has been following Jesus now in our story for some time. Has a decision to make. They have come to essentially a crossroad as a result of the decision that they will make in relation to. To what the Lord Jesus has said to them and the claims that he has made before them. And this will determine their future and perhaps even where they find themselves in eternity. There's no doubt by reading this that the words of the Lord that were spoken, they understood exactly what he was saying. There was no confusion there. But I read this and I find two truths in this at, of what the Lord's requiring and by the way the people reacted to what the Lord was asking first thing I found was everything Jesus said was true not just because of what he said in four verses here but everything he ever says in his word is true he is the way he is the truth and he is the life he's not a liar everything he says he does so first, what he says is true. But secondly, understand, not everything Jesus says is easy to do. And I believe that some of us have discovered that as well as we've been reading the Bible throughout our walk with the Lord. And, and may, maybe it is we don't, uh, we have difficulty sometimes understanding everything. And, and that's okay because there are some things that at, at first glance or first read that you don't fully understand. And that's why... Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And uh, we study to show ourselves approved unto God. And, and, and God helps us by the spirit leading us into all truth. And, and so we read the word. And, and sometimes we do have difficulty understanding. I have difficulty understanding sometimes what's really being said. But we're just wondering whether it's too hard to accept or to become committed to sometimes. We like the crowd either must take him at his word. Look at him. Believe, come to him, find eternal life in him, or just continue in life without him the way we always have. And that's the gospel. That's the message for a lost person listening today. Wandering around in darkness in this sinful world, 
that is forsaking God. And here's the thing. Jesus is not just confronting the crowd there. But he confronts everyone every day with the same situation and the same question. Because man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So this wasn't just for a little hillside social gathering. This is for us today. Will we stay or will we go? Is Jesus more than enough for you or does he not quite need meet your needs? Just, just listen to what took place that day. He, he's speaking to the Jews here. He is declaring to them, this is leading up to the text, that he's the bread of life. He, he's declaring to them that he is the one that came down from heaven and they're questioning his claim to be. They're murmuring and then that he, just, he declares to them that no one can come to the Father unless the Father draws them. He goes on to say that they've got to eat of his flesh and that they've got to drink of his blood and that was how they would have part with him. And that was the truth and God the Father had sent him. But look, let, let's look, if you've got your Bibles open, please, still. And let's read down to our text from verse 59. So that narrative took place, and John writes, These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? What he was literally saying was, this is a pretty difficult thing to have to do. I don't know that I can. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured, verse 61 at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he has before? It is the Spirit that quickened the flesh profit of nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, being Jesus, verse 65, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. And listen to what happened. Verse 1 of our text, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve. The twelve he called. What the Bible's referring to here is that Jesus called twelve, and then he went about teaching and being the example. And many of them come to him. Everywhere Jesus would go through the gospel, said the crowds would press into him. When he's headed to Jairus' daughter's house and the woman with the issue of blood crawls under the feet of the crowd and touches the hem of Jesus' garment, Jesus said, I felt virtue leave me. Who touched me? And it's as if the disciples would look at him and say, do you see the crowd around you? Everybody's touching you. He said, no, I felt power leave me. Everywhere he went, Crowds would press against him. And we, we know in this chapter, as I mentioned a moment ago, that this was just after the feeding of the 5,000. Not 5,000 people, 5,000 men with their wives and their children. So you're probably looking at eight to 10,000 people. And when he gets to verse 66, all of them are gone except for the 12. Thanks for the free lunch, Jesus. That's all we needed from you. And they walked away from him. Because to whom much is given, much is required. Verse 67, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the same Peter 
that denies the Lord Jesus the night of his judgment. Be careful what you commit unto the Lord by the mouth and by the heart. Because Jesus said, you, you, you do a lot of talking. This right here is far from me. And what Jesus is saying here is that he is all in all. He is everything that we need and that if we accept him, we'll never need for anything again. Didn't say it, you might not get your wants. But he said, I'll supply all your need according to my riches and glory. He tells them that he's the bread. He is the life because there's life in the blood. Many would receive it. He, we know that he came unto his own and his own received him not. And as many that would receive him and still will receive him, he gives them power to be sons and daughters of God. And that power is by the blood that was shed on a hill called Calvary. Nailed to an old rugged cross, whipped, despised, beaten, and rejected. Spit upon and cursed. Beard ripped out, insides hanging out. He was beaten to oblivion. They said he'd been nothing to look at. Hanging naked between heaven and earth for you and for me. That blood that shed out of his body is still available today. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. But you can't accept it. It's unlimited. You know what that tells me? There's enough for everybody. I love what Dr. Billy Graham said. I know I've said it before. I'll say it again. Christ didn't die for all. He died for each. Why? Because there's always going to be somebody coming to Calvary. Every time. There's room at the cross today for a sinner that will come to Calvary today. We'll, we'll close with this uh, story I just recently read talks about the bombing at Pearl Harbor in, in, in this story, but it, it narrows down to this gentleman at Pearl Harbor. The story's about a sailor who was manning an anti-aircraft battery on a battleship. The story goes on to talk a little bit about what was going on. It says that he fought for four solid hours while explosions and bombs and missiles were going off all around him. He had been injured and he was finally taken to the hospital with burns and shrapnel wounds all over his body. It says that when he got to the hospital that he received numerous amounts, like several pints of blood were given to him through a transfusion from the Red Cross blood bank. And they said that's what saved his life that day. And he says that when he recovered, he made a statement. And he said, I'm going back to America. And I'm going to give back pint by pint all the blood that was needed to save me. And more besides that. I want to say to the sinner today in closing, to the backslider who has turned away from God, and even to the believer today. It was Jesus' blood and only Jesus' blood that saved us. It saved us and washed us from our sin, and we can't pay him back. We'll never be able to make up for what he did for us, but in gratitude we ought to serve him with the best that we can. Oh, hear the words that Isaac Watts wrote of a song that we sang just a few minutes ago. But drops of blood can never repay the debt of love that I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. It's all that I can do. I want to point out today, I may have preached a sermon behind this pulpit. But it's Jesus that has been speaking to our hearts today. So the question in closing is this. Is your answer to the question today that you've come to the conclusion that there is no other alternative? That 
Your heart won't allow you to do anything else. That the love of Jesus is tearing down the walls that you have built up for so long around your heart. Would you come to Jesus today and accept him as Lord and Savior? Because I'm telling you right now, any minute, any second, Paul says at the moment in the twinkling of an eye, Jesus is coming back. If a believer or a skeptic has been sitting on the fence for some time, I repeat what I said at the beginning. Will you stay or will you go? Will you sit on the fence or will you jump off of it and begin to follow the Lord? He's more than enough. He is all that you'll ever need. Maybe you're listening and saying, yeah, you don't know me. Got a good life. Got a good job. Got a good kid. Got a big house. Got a truck. Got a boat. Got some good land. Got a good job. Got, got retirement set up. I'm a good preacher. Let me ask you a question. When heaven and earth burn up, where will you be? In your truck? In your boat? In your house? What does it profit you if you gain all that you got? And the trumpet sounds. You lost your soul. And when that happens and you stand before the Lord Jesus, what will you give in exchange for yourself? Nothing. Because it's all burned up. It'll all be gone. It'll be too late. And this week, I know it's crazy. And I'm, I'm going to pray. I thought about that twinkling of an eye. And I got in a place this week, as funny as it sounds, alone by myself. I tried to speak one word before I could blink my eye. I couldn't. You know what that tells me? When he comes, you'll never be able to pray a prayer. You'll never be able to read a scripture. You won't be able to call a preacher. You won't be able to find a place of repentance. When he comes, it's over. But there's hope today. Because the Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you'll confess your sins. He's faithful and just for your sins. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness and you will be saved. That's all it takes. Not, not a letter with the church, not dumped underwater, although that may come later. Just confession of the mouth and belief in the heart and surrender of your life and that's it. So you can either stay with the Lord Jesus or you can go. You got two choices and it's yours. But don't make the wrong one for it. It's too late. Let me pray this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around. Like the song said this morning, mercy tree the mercy tree he hung upon a tree for you and me death died loved one Jesus Christ overcome one day soon you can see his face to wipe away every tear, no more pain and suffering. If you'll accept him today. Maybe you're here and you just need prayer. You just say, I need, I need help. You're just struggling with making the decision. Pray for you every day that you'll make the right one. I, I don't know. Our lives can be, seem so uncertain sometimes and the decisions we have to make can seem so difficult they can be. But he said, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. So there's the invitation.
you need to come this morning, the altar's open. Get things right with the Lord. Talk to him about your struggles. He cares, folks. He cares about it all. He wants you. He wants all of you. Let me pray this morning.